Order. The sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning, and we will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And could, could I ask the Minister, uh, could he outline to the House if he intends to retain student governors within further education colleges? Uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, it is something that we are considering in the round. Um, Student governance, uh, alongside the wider governance issue in further education, uh, is something that we do need to be conscious of, particularly as colleges move to become uh, multi-million pound uh, businesses. Um, there are a number of different aspects in which uh, student participation and govern governance of the colleges uh, can be uh, taken forward, and that includes the issue of student representation on, on boards of governors, but there's also other aspects too in terms of sabbatical posts, which could be extended into the FE sector, and also the creation of student councils, and all of those are under discussion, um, including with the NUS USA. Mr. McKinney, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Isn't it important that boards of governors reflect a younger person's perspective? And could the minister consider capacity building and training for students in this role uh, to enable better governance skills? Yeah, I'm certainly happy to consider the point that the member makes about uh, capacity building. But it's also important to bear in mind that boards of governors um, aren't simply there to represent a, a series of different sectoral interests and try to fashion a, a, a position, a common position, out of, out of the different dynamics there. Uh, they are there as, in, as individuals who all of which can take a collective view of what is in the best interest, not just of their college, but also the sector and the Northern Ireland economy. I call Mr. Alec Atwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Given, uh, Minister, that you have appointed a team to review teacher education in Northern Ireland, and given your ambition that there should be a more shared and integrated approach, in respect to which there is merit, could you explain to the House why it is that you have gone on a solo run in respect of a shared and integrated outcome? And would it not be better that this was coordinated in a comprehensive way with the Minister of Education? Well, thank the member for his question and his interest and, and indeed uh, his um, endorsement that there is merit in moving towards a more shared and integrated um, system. Um, we have appointed um, Patsy Salberg, who is an international figure, and four other individuals, all of whom are of international standing, uh, to take forward the stage two of the review of, of teacher training. And in doing that, we have had discussions uh, with my colleague, the, the Minister of, of Education. He has clear responsibilities in relation to the nature of teacher training in terms of the content and also setting the numbers. It is my responsibility as Minister for Employment and Learning uh, to resource uh, the, the different uh, providers, the different institutions, and currently we have a situation which is not uh, sustainable. Uh, but we have consulted um, and discussed uh, these different aspects uh, and continue to do so on a regular basis. I note that the Minister has not denied that he is on a solar run in this matter. Putting that aside for a second, given that you say that you wish to have agreement in relation to the future shape, future shape of teacher training in uh, the north of Ireland, do you accept that if a teacher training college at the end of this process rightly decides that its autonomy, location and role is important and needs to be protected? Do you accept that in those circumstances you will not reach the threshold of agreement that you aspire to? Well, well first of all, the member uh, in particular should well know the, the nature of the relationship um, and the authority of ministers in relation to their own departments and also uh, to, to their colleagues. Uh, and he was very keen to ensure that others in the executive and the assembly understood that point as well. So um, I hope he's not shifting his position as he moves uh, to, the, to the back benches. I assume also that the member is referring to the situation pertaining uh, to St Mary's. Um, and again, it's disappointing that the SDLP are taking a very particular approach to this in terms of representing one particular institution rather than looking to the best interests of the sector as a whole and the future of the Northern Ireland education system as a whole. The fundamental point here in all of this is that whether you're talking about St Mary's or the system as a, as a whole, it is not financially sustainable today and it will not be the case in, as we look to, to the future. So we have to, to make some changes to ensure that we actually have an affordable system and also one that actually provides teachers that actually fit for a much more diverse and shared society as we, hopefully we, we move in that direction. I, Mr Michael Copeland is not in his place, so I call Mr Paul Gervin. Thank you. 
Minister, uh, just wondering from a departmental point of view, what instruction is given to uh, colleges uh, and universities in relation to, uh, as they don't have a uniform, in relation to clothing which is suitable to wear to college? Um, Mr. The Principal Deputy Speaker, the, the acoustics here are, are very weak, and I, I barely caught that. But um, I gathered that the member was talking about uh, standards of dress in terms of, of colleges. Um, those are uh, uh, matters of detail for the colleges themselves uh, to, to take forward. And um, I would suggest that this is a, probably a prelude to discussing various uh, symbols that may be associated with one section of the community um, or, or another. And I would stress that it's for the colleges to control that. But all of the, equal, the colleges um, have a commitments towards equality and, and good relations. And that will be reflected in, in the manner in which they, they address issues that may, may or may not cause tension in terms of the workplace uh, or the, the, the learning environment. Uh, can I just point out, members, it's useful to ensure that the microphone at your desk is pointed towards you. I know Paul has made his adjustment now, but for the benefit of other members, Paul, supplement. Thank, thank the Minister for his, his answer. And, uh, in, in his response, he did allude to the fact that uh, each college must uh, have this put in place. I thought those directives came from Central because understanding that one college in my own uh, constituency uh, made an instruction in relation to wearing of, of uh, football tops, uh, yet no direction was given to another section of the community that seemed to feel it is perfectly all right to attend wearing GAA tops. Uh, I mean, again, I thank the member for, for his question. And, I mean, if, if he wants to write me, to me with the specifics around this, I'll happily uh, take a look and um, raise the matters that he's raised directly with the colleges um, con concerned. Uh, in all of this, the colleges will have the, the ability to take advice, whether it's from my own department or, for, or from the, the Equality Commission. And he is right to say that we do need a standard approach uh, in this regard, so that everyone understands what is the parameters in, in terms of, of, of behaviour. I would stress, however, that we, we are evolving in Northern Ireland away from just talking about workplaces being neutral, where any notion of celebration of culture or identity are removed towards a more shared workplaces where within different parameters people do have the ability to express opinions uh, and also to, ex to express their, their identity. But obviously that has to be done in a very carefully balanced uh, way so, and, and those are very, very live debates that are happening uh, ac across the sector. Uh, but we will certainly take on board any particular comments that the member wishes to direct to us. Thank you. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. The Minister will, will be aware of continuing problems facing people through under the uh, unemployment. Can he indi indicate what discussions he has had with employers and trade unions with regards to the use of a zero arrow contracts? Thank you. Um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm conscious this is actually appearing on our formal list of, of questions uh, later on, but I mean I will proceed um, to, uh, to address the question uh, unless um, advised uh, otherwise. Um, the issue of zero hours contract is something that we are uh, conscious of in, in Northern Ireland. Given that the nature of the labour force survey and the sample size, at this stage it's not possible to give a reliable estimate of the number of zero hours contracts that may exist in Northern Ireland. But our, our impression would be that they, they are lesser uh, than their use in other parts of the United Kingdom. Just to take one snapshot, for example, it has been said that um, universities are some of the, of the more common uh, employers who use zero hours contracts. Uh, in, in terms of Northern Ireland, none of our universities uses zero hours contracts. That's just one snapshot from one particular sector that maybe just gives some, some meat to what I'm saying in terms of we suspect it's a lesser problem here. We have commissioned some uh, research to, to try to get a firmer basis and are clearly taking into account what's happening in terms of other jurisdictions before we take any policy decisions on, on any changes or legislative action we may wish to take in Northern Ireland. Of that, uh, draw attention to members. Uh, if questions are, you know, it's very clear the topic of question uh, is, is uh, similar to one that's already listed for oral answer, then, you know, in future, uh, I will not, uh, I'll not call for an answer to that question because I think the, uh, if, if other members of other parties have taken the trouble to lodge a question, then uh, we should have the courtesy to allow that to happen. Uh, in these circumstances, and uh, I'm taking the opportunity just to kind of make it clear that uh, the speakers will normally, from now on, intervene and prevent that happening. Supplementary, Mr. Sean Lynch. 
Can I remind uh, uh, that previous last can call you? And I understand what you, you're saying and accept what you're saying. Um, but uh, going great precisely in the era, I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Could he outline what consideration he has given to the introduction of legislation through the Employment Law Review to appropriately regulate the use of the zero hour contracts that protect the rights of workers? Thank you. Well, the, the issue is not formally part of the, the current um, public consultation that's underway, which closes um, at the beginning of, of November. Um, we could nonetheless take forward a consultation in Northern Ireland on a freestanding basis, and that could tie in with any future employment, employment bill that may come before th this House. I would stress that given that this is a legislative matter, that will be something where the House uh, will need to take its own decision on the, the way forward. Um, we are looking closely in terms of any policy changes that may happen in, in Great Britain. And I think that the one area where people are maybe zeroing in, if I can use that term, um, as a cause of, of particular concern is around exclusivity. There may be circumstances where a zero hours contract is, is beneficial to, to a person, uh, but where most of the concern has been uh, expressed is around em employers saying that a person can only work for that one um, employer and they're on a zero hours contract and that denies them other opportunities to work. So that has emerged as perhaps the the, the single strongest aspect where concern has been expressed, and we may indeed uh, come back to the House in that matter. And before we move on, uh, I've received an apology from Michael Copeland, and uh, I thank him for that. Mr. Ross Hussey has, uh, has also sent an apology and has given uh, an appropriate explanation. So we'll move on, and I call Mr. Samuel Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I'm here. <laughs> What steps does the Minister take to ensure fair distribution of higher level courses uh, across all campuses of our regional further education colleges? Um, again, I thank the member for his, 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 um, his question. We do have uh, six excellent FE colleges and also our, our universities as well. Um, and it's, it's for, in terms of the, the the courses themselves is for the colleges to, to develop their own uh, curricula and um, their prospectuses in terms of the courses that, that are, are available. When it comes to the very particular issue of um, higher education and further education, uh, we do distribute what is essentially a Mazen uh, figure uh, in relation to uh, further education, uh, and that is, is changed based uh, each year on relative performance. The member will note that over uh, recent years we, we have been in a position that we have increased uh, the Madison figure uh, for uh, the colleges across uh, Northern Ireland and indeed there may well be additional uh, changes in that regard in, in the future. And also part-time higher education falls out, outside of Madison and that's an area of particular growth. Um, we have a commitment to seriously increase the number of foundation degrees offered in Northern Ireland because they are something that are of particular use uh, for developing high-level vocational skills uh, and employers are very central to the development of the curricula in, in that regard. Thank you, Mr Gardner, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy uh, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Ninety-eight per cent of the budget of FE colleges come from the taxpayer. Given this, will the Minister investigate why the Newry campus of the Southern Regional College, with 32% of the catchment population, has 75% of higher education foundations, enrolments, and Portadown and Lurgan, with 32% of the population, have only 25%. Um, I, mean, I, I understand the point that the member is making, and I'm happy to uh, address those issues with Brian Dornan, uh, the director of Southern Regional College. But ultimately, it is a decision for the, the, the colleges themselves uh, to, to place their different courses, uh, and they do that um, out of a reflection of where demand is coming from, and also as to how they, they can best engage uh, with, with employers. And to give one example of very good practice, um, Southern Regional College have worked closely with uh, Norbrook Laboratories uh, in relation to development of apprenticeships and are now moving also to a, a level four uh, apprenticeship. So that is a very clear sign of how colleges are working together with employers to push the boundaries in terms of what can be offered uh, within the FE uh, sector. And that's something that's very much in the best interests of, of Northern Ireland. But I'll certainly reflect um, the comments made back to the director that specifically the members made. Thank you. And that brings an end to the period for uh, topical questions. We will now move on to those questions that are listed for oral questions. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Question number one, please. 
Okay, we're, we're back to the FE sector. So over the, the past 10 years, my department's officials have been working closely with the colleges to oversee substantial levels of investment in their estates. The further education sector has been upgraded with a series of new state-of-the-art campuses which contain the latest technology and industry standard equipment. The investment has been crucial to enable further education colleges to support economic and workforce development as set out in the FE strategy, FE means business. The investment has been delivered through conventional procurement and public-private partnerships. The focus remains the provision of a fit-for-purpose education estate which supports the delivery of a modern and dynamic curriculum and delivers the education and training which enhances the skills and employability of Northern Ireland's workforce. A total of £262 million has been invested in the FE sector over the last 10 years. The major projects uh, include North West Regional Colleges, uh, refurbishments and new builds in Derry and Limavady, BMC's E3 campus at Springville, South West Colleges uh, campuses in Enniskillen and Cookstown, South East Regional Colleges, £4 million construction centre in Newtonards, Northern Regional Colleges, £12 million campus in Larne and Newton Abbey, and Southern Regional Colleges, £4 million pound upgrade to its Newry West campus. The remainder of the budget was used across the sector to address health and safety deficiencies and to meet the requirements of the Disability Discrimination Act. In addition to the departmental capital uh, input, a further £124 million of private sector investment has been generated through the public-private partnership projects in the FE sector. These are the Belfast Metropolitan College's Titanic Quarter Campus, the South West College campuses in Dungannon and Oma, and the Southern Southeastern Regional, uh, Regional College campus in Lisburn, Newcastle, Balnehinch and Downpatrick. Supplementary. Um, thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But could I ask the Minister, does he agree with me that the Southern Regional College has been underrepresented in the allocation of capital investment over the last 10 years? Um, the short answer to, to that uh, supplementary is yes, and uh, we are looking forward uh, very soon to receiving uh, a number of business cases from Southern Regional College in relation to uh, further in investment uh, in that area, and they relate to Armagh, Banbridge, and the, the Craig Avon area. Um, it is certainly a priority uh, for me and my department in relation to further uh, capital spend, and I hope to, to be in a position to make uh, some uh, announcements uh, in that regard within the, the next number of months. Thank you. And before I call the next question, could, or before I call the next speaker, could I just inform the members that questions nine and fourteen have been withdrawn? And I call Mervyn Story for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, the principal speaker. The minister will not be, I'm sure, surprised to know that I want to raise the issue in relation to the lack of capital investment in the Balamoni campus of the Northern Regional College and also uh, in the Balamina campus. And can, could he tell the House? as to when he believes he will be in receipt of a business case and will he give this House an assurance that in the outcome and the outworking of that business case that the Ballymoney campus won't be the sacrificial lamb to any new proposals which would take the college out of the borough? Again, I thank Mr Story for his, his question. Um, again, I can re reflect that um, the Northern Regional College area has not had the same level of capital investment as some other parts of Northern Ireland in recent years, and it is my intention to rectify that in terms of, of future spend. We are expecting a business case shortly uh, from NRC uh, to take forward a number of projects. Um, th that will include um, the, the Balamina area and also uh, a, a, a revised proposal for the, 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 the northern half uh, of, of the area. Obviously, we have Coleraine and Balamoney in the mix in that regard. I can assure the member that no decisions have been taken uh, in, in this regard, uh, but it, it is something that um, we will see what comes back in terms of, of the business case, and I'm happy to con continue the discussions I've had with the member and his colleagues uh, over the future provision uh, in, in that area. Ultimately, what's important is we actually find an outcome that works for the people of the, of the area, rather than simply talking about whether it's one location or another, because the ultimate prize here is ensuring we have skilled young people who are actually capable of taking up jobs in, in that local community. Well, Mr. Danny Kinahan for a supplement. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And he, he's touched on it, but I'd like him to be a, a bit more specific. But could he outline how he's encouraging and facilitating collaboration 
between the regional colleges and the business community in order to support progression into business-related opportunities? Uh, again, I thank the member for, for his question, uh, and I would particularly draw attention to the fact that we are currently undertaking a major uh, review of apprenticeships and also a review of youth training. We want to ensure that what is happening in terms of the FE sector in particular is relevant to the needs of, of the business uh, community. Also, if you look at the issue of the, the foundation degrees that we are promoting as a department, they are very much informed uh, by the needs of employers. So, in that respect, they are different from the, the, the more traditional uh, bachelor's degrees uh, that, that are offered by universities and also to a, a small extent uh, the, the FE sector. And finally, I would also emphasise that we are currently going through a process of a revised uh, further education strategy for Northern Ireland. Um, the FE means business, which is the current strategy, dates back to 2004. But I am pleased to say that on the back of that strategy, we have seen a major change in terms of how the FE sector has been positioned vis-à-vis uh, -vis business. And the purpose of our revised strategy will be to further consolidate uh, th that growth and to make sure that uh, the FE sector really is de de developing to its full potential for the Northern Ireland economy. I call Mr. Jim Mallister. Um, given the deficit in the North Antrim provision, has the Minister any comment to make on the fact that year on year his department is spending over £8 million educating over 4,000 students from the Republic of Ireland free of charge? And does the Minister not think that the Northern Ireland taxpayer might expect the priorities to be to make provision for those? whose parents pay their taxes in this jurisdiction rather than free provision for others? Uh, I thank the member uh, for his question. And it's not just an issue for the Northern Ireland taxpayer, it's an issue for the UK taxpayer um, as a whole, given the, the nature of the subvention that, that, that comes here. I am fully, fully aware of, of the situation, and it is worth drawing attention to the House that probably about three quarters uh, of that uh, spend derives from the Donegal to Derry uh, corridor, which probably reflects the lack of equivalent FE provision in the northwest uh, of, of the island. Uh, we are required under European Union directives uh, to treat um, the, the citizens of other European Union uh, jurisdictions as we would treat our own. We have, no ch we have no choice in this matter, and we derive huge benefits from the European Union, so that, that goes with the territory. Um, the, the ultimate answer to this, of course, lies in terms of encouraging the Republic of Ireland uh, to invest in their own uh, uh, systems, um, and in particular in the North West region, and discussions uh, with uh, whether it's the Education Minister or indeed the Taoiseach are ongoing in that matter. And I call Mr. Barry Michael Duff. Uh, question number two. Uh, South West College's allocation of full time higher education places has increased from 186 in 2008-2009 to 542 in 2013-14. This significant increase is the result of my department's annual review of college allocations and also additional full-time places that I have made available. The review of each college's allocation is based on established current and projected demand for higher education in each of the college areas and the college's alignment with the department's strategic priorities. Southwest College has been the best performing provider of higher education and further education across a range of metrics, including the provision of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and foundation degrees. For this reason, in July 2013, I awarded 43 extra places exclusively for STEM foundation degrees at Southwest College. Following a request from the college, I have been able to, to give approval for an additional 25 places. This further demonstrates my commitment to increase places in higher education in the South West. Uh, my department is committed to carrying out further reviews of college allocations in the future and to providing additional places when extra resources are identified. It is the responsibility of the senior management in the regional college to apply their allocation of full-time higher education places across campuses and curriculum areas, and in doing so, to balance local demand and departmental priorities. However, my department does not place a cap on part-time higher education places. An expansion of that provision therefore offers colleges another route to increase higher education opportunities. Barney McElduff for a supplementary. Uh, May Ogot, uh, can I welcome the Minister's very positive response and acknowledge that Dell has worked positively with and responded very well to 
the requirements of FE College in Oma and uh, other campuses. Can I ask the Minister now to assess the case for the extension of higher level apprenticeships uh, to that area to encourage inward investors to show perhaps greater interest in Tyrone and Fermanagh west of the ban? Um, I thank the member for, for his question and happy to confirm to him that South West College is already piloting for us a higher level apprenticeship at level four in ICT and has also just started um, a higher level apprenticeship at level four in engineering. I should also say that Northern Regional College is also going to be joining in the higher level engineering uh, app apprenticeship. So that is an indication uh, of the direction of travel uh, that we're trying to achieve uh, with the, the wider rev uh, review of, of, of apprenticeships. We do want to see the apprenticeship model being extended to higher skill levels and we believe that as the skills profile of Northern Ireland needs to change to meet the, the differing needs of employers. Uh, apprenticeships offer a very attractive route both for, for employers and also for, for young people and indeed, and indeed others. So I'm glad to say that South West College has been very proactive and we, ha we have uh, joined in partnership with them to facilitate that. I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his response. But would the Minister not agree that the lack of increased provision in OMA and the, is a huge hindrance to the excellent strides already been made by the college, uh, and if not addressed, has the potential to cause uh, detrimental consequences for future development. Well, I would stress to the member that the South West College is a, a very progressive college. It has been inc incredibly uh, successful in what it, it has done. Indeed, it is, is now respected throughout the UK as being a, a STEM centre. Um, and it, it, so it, it has really established a strong track record in that regard. If there's issues in particular in terms of the allocation of courses and additional opportunities, I will certainly reflect that back to Maliki McAleer, uh, the, the director. But I think it is important to stress that uh, higher education uh, within FE is moving forward and is moving forward particularly well within the, the South West area. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome the statement by the Minister in relation to South West College. Is the Minister and the Department giving any consideration to establishing a rural university network and perhaps the South West College could be a hub for such a development? Thanks. Uh, I thank the member, member for his question. Um, he will probably, probably be aware that uh, Project 10, uh, as it's known of our higher education strategy, relates to how we can uh, create better access for higher education for those people who are living in more, the more rural and remote areas of Northern Ireland. We are currently at a policy for formulation area to see how best we can take, take that forward. Um, it is important that we do ensure that we have access, particularly for those students who may well be accessing um, higher education on a part-time basis. So that's something that we're giving active consideration to. And obviously, uh, South West College um, would be a very logical partner for us in that regard. I call on Mr. Chris Little. Question three, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, uh, I will group questions three and six. I would also like to request an additional minute for the answer. A pilot of the Community Family Support Programme involving 44 families has recently been completed. This has confirmed the effectiveness of the initiative, which has had a number of very positive outcomes. Three parents have moved into employment. Four young people have returned to school or entered training programmes, and a number of mothers are, vol are volunteering in the community. Following a competitive tendering process in September 2013, five lead organisations and a range of partners have been awarded contracts to deliver up the upscaled programme to at least 720 families across Northern Ireland. This is part of the Delivering Social Change initiative under the Executive, and this phase of the programme will run from October 2013 to March 2015. This programme is now operational, and the new providers are, are in the process of recruiting families. The programme will be delivered in five contract areas based on the Health and Social Care Trust areas. The main providers are the Upper Springfield Development Trust in the Belfast region, Network Personnel in the Northern and Southern region, Dairy Farm People First in the Southeastern region, and customised training services in the Western region. The initiative is designed to help families make life-changing decisions to enhance their prospects and to become full participants in society. The programme will also support families with a high level of need to develop their capacity to reach their full potential. Families will receive help from professional support workers to enhance parenting and life skills. 
The 26-week programme will include a family learning component to address the health, social, economic, educational, employment and training issues that impact on their daily lives. The programme will also support parents of young people not in employment, education or training, or NEETS as they're widely known, to re-engage with employment, education or training. In this way, it is hoped that they will help prevent younger family members falling into the NEETS category. Community Family Support Programme providers will work in partnership with statutory agencies such as the Health and Social Care Trusts and the Youth Justice Agency to support families. Chris Little for the supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I wholeheartedly welcome the Minister's investment in families to ensure that our young people have equal opportunity to education, training and employment. Can I ask the Minister what he thinks are the key factors to the success of this particular intervention? Um, I thank the member for his question and, and, and supplementary. As you stress, I mean, this is a, a good news story, uh, not just for my department, but also the, the executive. And it comes as part of, of a wider uh, delivering social change um, initiative that is seeking to uh, invest more in social programmes alongside economic programmes and also to join the, the two up increasingly. In particular, this is having a, a success because it's working alongside uh, other agencies. It's coordinated with the, the wider family support hubs that, that are also being taken forward by, with the Department of Health uh, in, in, in the lead. And in terms of how we're working with families, we're, we're adopting a whole family solution to this. This is not simply about working directly with vulnerable young people. It's working with the whole family and looking to the underlying family dynamics uh, that are, are creating problems. And that's why we're seeing solutions that are benefit not just young people themselves in terms of, of um, improved outcomes, but also other family members. And I certainly have been very pleased at the feedback that we have received uh, from this and some of the testimonials, including in the members' own consistency of East Belfast, where people have talked about their, their lives being turned around by this initiative. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his response thus far. Um, could I ask the Minister, you mentioned this is a good news story, and I would certainly agree with you, that will there be uh, an interim evaluation being carried out? Because I think this is the sort of scheme that Northern Ireland needs, and I know it's great news that we're now having um, 720 um, families involved, but it's something we could actually extend in the future, and I'm sure there will be quite a lot of support within this, this chamber for it. Um, again, I thank the member for his, his question and um, his endorsement of the, the, the programme. It is something that we are keen to see if we can ex extend uh, further, so w within the rules of, around procurement and also taking into account the, the capacity of our delivery partners, uh, subject to additional resources uh, being, being identified either within my own department or, or centrally, this could be upscaled uh, further. Um, I think if you see the, the fact that we're moving from a pilot of 44 to rolling it out across Northern Ireland with addressing 720 families, you see that the scale of the upskilling that we're doing in this regard. And this is something that has only been in operation since the beginning of 2013, so it does, we are seeing remarkable quick progress in this regard. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker and the Minister. And in the context of that reply, uh, uh, can you indicate to the House if the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister have indicated if funds from the uh, Social Investment Fund could be used to expand the programme? Um, well, there is financial support coming for this from uh, OFM, DFM as part of the Delivering Social Change um, investment. So exactly how funds move around from one place to another isn't something that I'm particularly qualified to, to or, or in a position uh, to, to answer. Uh, but it is fair to say that the funding is being made available for this. There's not an issue that um, we are, we're looking around for the resources. There's been a commitment both from my department with respect to the pilot and also with OFM DFM in terms of the upscaling uh, to date. And we will have further discussions to see how we can upscale uh, further. Um, as we see real progress being made, uh, the executive and my own department will respond by actually ensuring we're actually getting best value for the money that is available in Northern Ireland. And that's not about keeping it in our own pockets. It's actually about spending it in the community and making a real difference. I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. Uh, the Minister did indicate that uh, the, um, the support programme is actually working with other statutory agencies, but could he indicate if it also works alongside the United Youth programme? And if uh, this Minister is in charge of that United Youth programme and its budget? 
Well, I, I thank the, the, the member for his very searching uh, question and uh, the temptations that he's putting in, in front of me. Let me say that the, the Community Family Support Programme is a freestanding initiative that predates uh, United Youth and is, is separate from that. With regard to United Youth, I, I've placed on records my initial concerns around this, but uh, discussions are proceeding um, uh, behind the scenes between uh, advisors and officials uh, across the, the relevant uh, de departments. And indeed, there is a major design meeting that's going to be held uh, tomorrow morning uh, to take things forward uh, further. Uh, so there are issues, obviously, in terms of how we, we actually design this to make sure it, it has the best impact in terms of all of the outcomes that have been identified uh, in the, the statement that was made by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister in, in May of, of this year. Uh, but I, I am pleased to see that, that progress has been made. In the period uh, April 2013 to date, the Employment Service has helped 375 young pe unemployed people from the West Belfast area to find employment. In addition, since I launched the Youth Employment Scheme last September, 95 employers have signed agreements to, to participate in the scheme in West Belfast. To date, 331 positions have been advertised in the West Belfast area, with 181 young people availing of the scheme. 58 young people have also commenced temporary employment opportunities under the new First Start initiative. This was established as a direct response to the economic downturn and as part of the Northern Ireland Executive's Economy and Jobs initiative. Steps to Work remains my department's main adult return to work programme. It provides a wide range of assistance to help people find employment and is available to all age groups, including those in the 18 to 24 bracket. In addition, the Training for Success programme provides a guaranteed training place for all unemployed young people in the 16 to 17 age group. Across West Belfast, employment service staff continue to work in partnership with, with Belfast City Council to deliver job and opportunities. They also collaborate with Libraries Northern Ireland to deliver successful job clubs, which help young unemployed people to address barriers to employment. With a total budget of more than £25 million, the Executive's Pathway to Success strategy is exploring new approaches to address the barriers faced by young people aged 16 to 24 who are not in education, employment or training. They include a collaboration and innovation fund, the local employment intermediary service, a community family support programme, the learner access agreement pilot and educational maintenance allowance for young people participating under projects under the strategy. Ms. Rosalie McCorley for a supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for his questions of, or for his answers tonight. Uh, can I say that um, I appreciate all of that information in regards to um, the uh, steps taken to provide youth uh, opportunities, but would the Minister not agree that uh, what is required in highly deprived areas like West Belfast are proper paid government-sponsored positions offering real jobs rather than temporary replacement temporary placements for benefit payments well i thank the member for, for her question and this really touches on the two different angles that we have to come to the issue of, of uh, getting people in, into employment first of all we have to invest in, in the skills uh, of, of people um, in particular young people and also the employability skills where people can actually search for a job and actually just to, to sustain a job and then we have the issue in terms of how we create job opportunities uh, that people uh, can, can actually access. Uh, so that involves collaboration across a whole host of, of different uh, departments. Ultimately, most of the job creation in Northern Ireland to the future is going to be through, through the private sector. Already, we have a very large uh, public sector. Um, while I'm not suggesting that be shrunk, uh, we, we nonetheless have to recognise that it, uh, it is, uh, we, we do have an imbalance. And it's through the, the growth of the private sector that we're likely to, to see the biggest leaps in terms of employment opportunities over the coming years. Thank you. Mr. Allegatwood. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Minister give his personal commitment, if not a cast iron guarantee, that when it comes to work programmes for those young people unemployed in West Belfast or any other constituency, that he will not adopt the Tory proposals outlined by the Prime Minister last week that sees young people penalised by daily signing on, questionable work activities, and other punitive measures? measures. Will you give a guarantee that on your watch, you will not introduce those sort of punitive measures against our young people. 
Well, I thank the member for his question. Obviously, this is something that is of grave concern um, in the community and also um, in, in this House. Um, I, I don't believe that the proposals outlined actually make a terrible uh, amount of sense. Even the notion of making people sign on every day uh, becomes fairly pointless and nugatory in terms of the, the actual benefit that is derived uh, by the, the people themselves. And for some of the other schemes, they've come very close to uh, almost humiliating young people, including young people, uh, for not being able uh, to, to access uh, work. There will also be implications in terms of, of additional staffing if we were to, to follow suit uh, in, in that regard. That, that said, it is important that we do nonetheless um, study what is, co is coming across because if there are requirements in terms of parity, uh, the executive as a whole will need to take a judgment uh, as to whether we want to breach parity because we feel that what is being put forward is, is inappropriate and, and to do something different. But that will have to be a decision we take into account once we understand fully the implications around this and also the, the financial uh, po point of view. Almost there's two different departments that come to this uh, in partnership uh, if something similar was to be adopted. First of all, the issue of uh, benefit conditionality is a matter for the Department of Social Development, as, as the member uh, will, will well know. And that means that in terms of people's uh, access to benefits, they have to fulfil uh, certain conditions. Any additional programme uh, that would be put in place would, would fall to my department uh, to take forward. So the executive has discussed uh, the, this issue. It was a major item uh, of discussion uh, at our meeting uh, last week, and uh, further investigations are taking place. But it is safe to say that um, across the board in Northern Ireland, people do not see the relevance of this programme or how it actually makes a huge, a huge amount of sense. And what the executive is stressing is that we want to address the issue of unemployment through the job creation, not through punishment of those who find themselves unemployed. Call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, Principal De De Deputy Speaker. Uh, although the question refers specifically to uh, West Belfast, uh, youth unemployment is a major issue in other parts of the city, South Belfast, my own area, and indeed I suspect in North and East Belfast. Could the Minister widen out on some of the figures and statistics that he has given in relation to uh, West Belfast for the other areas? Uh, I thank the member for his question, and um, I'm happy to, to write to him to provide him with the, the, the full equivalent statistics for each of the four uh, Belfast um, uh, constituencies. But safe to say that um, the programmes that I have outlined in relation to West Belfast are available across uh, Northern Ireland, and that obviously includes um, all, all of Belfast. Um, he's right to say that unemployment and issues regarding lack of skills um, are faced in, in every uh, constituency, and uh, so that's why we are making that, that, that commitment. Uh, available. Um, we are pleased that, that we have had a positive uptake in terms of the, the, the schemes that we have in place, but there's still a long journey uh, to make. Uh, but overall, youth unemployment in Northern Ireland is, is falling, and that we are, while we still have a serious situation, compared to uh, um, elsewhere in Europe, uh, we're, we're in a more promising situation than elsewhere. I call Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. In April 2013, I introduced a 100% funding arrangement across the suite of management and leadership programmes. This recognised the importance of management and leadership skills to the Northern Ireland economy and the difficulties that many companies here are experiencing in the current economic climate. The 100% funding arrangement will initially run to the end of March 2014. Jointly with Invest Northern Ireland, the Department has developed an online diagnostic tool to identify and signpost available management and leadership development support. The Leadership and Management Skills Assessment tool then refers the user to relevant departmental and invest in I events and programmes. The departmental programmes signposted by the tool are offered through my department's management and leadership suite. This comprises the management analysis and planning programme, the management and leadership development programme and the intro graduate programme. The management analysis and planning programme addresses the overall management and leadership capabilities of a whole organisation through the completion of a diagnostic report by an independent business consultant. The Management and Leadership Development Programme offers a range of accredited interventions aimed at the, eventual, at the individual man manager. The Intro Graduate Programme is an entry into management level initiative designed to speed the development of graduate managers. The suite represents 29 separate interventions covering all management levels within micro-businesses, SMEs and social economy enterprises. 
Since April 2013, 70, 72 companies have signed up uh, to, the, to the MAP programme and 700 individual managers to the, the, the uh, development programme. Almost $1.5 million in funding has been committed to Northern Ireland managers since April. Order. We must move on now to questions to the Minister.